This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman, here in New York, with Juan Gonzalez, who's broadcasting from his home in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, we begin today's show in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where President Donald Trump will host a massive indoor campaign rally Saturday, despite concerns that the gathering will lead to a surge in COVID-19 cases in a state where the virus is already alarmingly on the rise. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported Oklahoma has seen a 7.7 percent increase in COVID cases, the largest in the country. Tulsa's health director said he wished the president would postpone the rally, the first since the outbreak of the coronavirus in the U.S. in March, due to concerns about the virus. The mayor has also said he doesn't want it there now. Two Oklahoma lawyers have sued an attempt to halt the rally, saying the event will endanger the Tulsa community. Despite public health experts' warnings against large indoor gatherings, the Trump administration is moving forward with plans to fill the 19,000-seat arena for the rally, with tens of thousands more in the nearby convention center. Vice President Mike Pence, who will attend the rally, falsely claimed that, in a very real sense, Oklahoma had flattened the curve of COVID infections. This is Trump speaking Monday. Oklahoma is uh, at a very low number. They've done uh, really fantastic work. They have a new, a pretty new, magnificent uh, arena, as you probably have heard, uh, and we're getting exact numbers out, but we're either close to or over one million people wanting to go. Uh, we have a 22,000-seat arena, but I think we're going to also take the convention hall next door, and that's going to hold 40,000, so we'll have 22,000 plus 40,000, which would mean that we'd have over 900,000 people that won't be able to go, but uh, hopefully they'll be watching. The Trump campaign is requiring attendees to his rally to sign a waiver absolving the campaign of liability if an attendee contracts COVID-19. But they are not requiring the attendees to wear masks in contravention of the CDC. This comes as President Trump also faces outrage for choosing Tulsa, Oklahoma, as the location of his first rally amidst a nationwide uprising against racism and police brutality. The Trump administration rescheduled the rally to Saturday, after originally announcing it would be held this Friday. That's June 19th, or Juneteenth, a celebration of African Americans' liberation from slavery. But Tulsa is also the site of one of the deadliest massacres in U.S. history. In 1921, 99 years ago this month, a white mob attacked a black neighborhood in Tulsa, killing as many as 300 African Americans. Over two days, white mobs set fire to homes, businesses and churches in Greenwood, a thriving African American business district known at the time as Black Wall Street. When the smoke cleared, the area lay in ruins. This is an excerpt from a History Channel documentary, The Night Tulsa burned, which features some of the survivors who were just children when the attack occurred. This is George Monroe, followed by Juanita Burnett Arnold and Ernestine Alpha Gibbs. I will always remember four men coming in our house with torches, and my mother saw them coming, and she put the four of we children under the bed. And from under the bed, we could see them walking to the curtains and setting fire to the curtains to set our house on fire. We start hearing shots, and my grandfather told us all to get up. And we got up, and we could see smoke and, and, and hear, hear shots, and we couldn't sleep or anything. We, we were just frightened nearly to death. But as soon as daylight came, oh, we looked outside. All of these people were coming down this free road track. We didn't nobody try to take a thing, and those people were coming along one track. They just had clothes on, that's all. Didn't try to take anything. For more, we go to Tulsa, Oklahoma 
where we're joined by Hannibal Johnson, attorney and author of several books about the history of Tulsa's African American community, including Black Wall Street, from riot to renaissance in Tulsa's historic Greenwood District. Up from the Ashes and Images of America, Tulsa's historic Greenwood District. So, if you could start, Hannibal Johnson, by talking about what happened 99 years ago this month. What happened in Tulsa in 1921 was really emblematic of the racial violence that uh, pervaded the United States during that period. In fact, historians and sociologists refer to the early part of the 20th century as the nadir of race relations in America, the low point of race relations in America, because of the proliferation of these so-called race riots, mostly invasions of black communities by vigilante white mobs, and because of the prevalence of lynching, lynching being a form of domestic terrorism targeting primarily African Americans. So this was a period fraught with uh, racial violence and historical racial trauma. Uh, the event in, in Tulsa is the worst of the so-called race riots during this period uh, in terms of its, its magnitude. The business community in the Greenwood District, the black sector in Tulsa, was highly developed, uh, a great concentration of service providers like doctors, lawyers, pharmacists, and dentists, but all manner of business enterprises, small businesses like movie theaters, dance halls, barber shops restaurants, grocery stores, haberdasheries, shine shops, a real concentration of black entrepreneurship and black wealth in a 35 square block area in Tulsa, Oklahoma, separated from downtown Tulsa by the Frisco tracks. Uh, well, uh Mr. Hannibal Johnson, this you mentioned the the racial conflicts of that period, which many Americans are, are not aware of. But there were uh, throughout the country in the post in the World War One, post World War One period, there were these huge conflicts. There was the uh, the Houston Mutiny of of nineteen seventeen of, uh, of black soldiers against uh, racism that they were perceiving in the military. There was the East St. Louis riot of nineteen seventeen, the Chicago right. riot of nineteen nineteen, and the Elaine, Arkansas massacre, where about over a hundred African Americans were massacred uh, in Elaine. Was part of this the result of the fact that as African Americans we began being impressed into the military, there was uh, even more uh, a willingness uh, on one on the one hand of African Americans to stand up for their rights and also of whites to seek to suppress uh, the African American community. Right. I think it's important to understand the pervasiveness and the power of white supremacy as a philosophy during this period. So we had these African American men who went off to war in foreign countries, sacrificed uh, their their lives potentially for the country and for uh, their American citizenship. They come back to the United States and they're treated as at best second class citizens, at worst subhuman. So black men uh, were much more vocal about protecting their civil rights um, after having served in, in World War I. On the flip side of that, the white community, noticing this this new sense of embold, emboldenment on the part of African Americans, was determined to enforce white supremacy. And these events that were called race riots and these lynchings are really in service of white supremacy. It's very interesting, because we've been looking at the bringing down of the Confederate statues around the country and the naming of uh, military bases after Confederates, like Fort Bragg. And this was right around the same time, not during the Civil War, but way after that they named these bases after Confederate soldiers, again, as they saw the rising empowerment of African Americans to pull them down. I wanted to go to Tulsa native professor Olivia Hooker, a survivor of the Green Wood massacre, describing the attack on her community that took place when she was just six years old. She was 92 when she did this interview. I refused to call it a riot because it was really, you know, uh, 
whites decided to burn down the homes of 10,000 people. So that was not a riot. It was a planned desecration. And when the mobs came in, they had those pole, those pine, you know, knots all lighted up, and they set things on fire. And my mother refused to run because she was busy putting water on the house to try to keep it from burning. And so she put the children under the big oak table. You know, they had those great big tables in those days with little nooks under them. So we were under the table when the mobs came in. So that's Tulsa native Professor Olivia Hooker talking about what happened in 1921. And I wanted to ask you, Hannibal Johnson, um, about President Trump choosing Tulsa. Um, now, of course, there's the surge, and we know that COVID-19 hits the African-American community much harder than the rest of the community in this country. There's a surge in Tulsa. Many of the leaders are asking for it not to be held there. And um, he was going to hold it Friday, Juneteenth, the celebration of the end of slavery, which is outraged so many that even President Trump was forced to put it um, off for a day. Uh, Kamala Harris, a senator from California vying for the vice presidency uh, under uh, a President Joe Biden administration, if that were to happen, said this isn't just a wink to white supremacists. He's throwing them a welcome home party. Can you respond to this choice of location and the original date? Right. So the rally uh, is troubling to a lot of people because of both the, the venue, to Tulsa, and because of the timing. So we're in the midst of a, of a COVID pandemic. We're in the midst of a surge here in Tulsa, bringing um, thousands of people together uh, in a tight space where, where it's not possible okay. to socially distance, where people don't have to wear masks. Those people are going to attend the rally, then they're going to spill out into the community writ large and pose substantial risk to all of us here. So that in and of itself is a problem. Uh, the, the other problem with, with timing is that even though the, the rally has now been moved to June 20th as opposed to June 19th, it's still Juneteenth weekend. There still are festi festivities going on. It's a celebratory atmosphere of a very significant day in our history, particularly for African Americans. The rally comes two and a half weeks after the 99th anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Um, so it's an issue of sensitivity uh, at, at the very least. Um, and and the, other, the other dynamic that's important to think about is the character of, of the rally. And we know something about the the potential character of the rally based on prior experience with these sorts of rallies, which tend to be raucous. Uh, they tend to be exclusive rather than inclusive. Uh, they, they tend um, to have elements of, of race and racism as part of the experience. So that troubles a lot of people, because here in Tulsa, we are working hard on reconciliation, on moving our community closer together as we approach the 100th anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. And the, the rally has the potential to be a disruptor to, to, to where we are on the road to reconciliation. I wanted to ask you, uh, of course, the country has been swept for weeks now by protests over uh, police abuse uh, and uh, and the murders of African-Americans. But the Tulsa police major Travis Yates uh, recently denied the existence of systemic racism in the police force. He said African-Americans probably should be shot more. Uh, in, a, in a recording, you can hear him say, quote, all of the research says we're shooting African-Americans about 24 percent less than we probably ought to be based on the crimes being committed. Y your response to uh, to the police major in your city? Well, he says that remark was taken out of context, but the remark speaks for itself. It, it is deeply troubling. Uh, it has been um, it has been rebuked by both the police chief, Wendell Franklin, and the mayor, G.T. Bynum. And it is not reflective of the officers 
ranking officers uh, whom I know and have worked with for many, many, many years. Uh, but again, it is, <laughs> it is deeply troubling. Whatever the context may have been, whatever the intention may have been, it's deeply problematic to put that put those words together um, on a radio show in the midst of all the things that the country is going through and all the things that we've gone through here in Tulsa. And of course, you have the situation of the two kids. I don't even want to say jaywalking, thirteen-year-old Tulsa residents who were brutalized by the police. I mean, the video of these kids, one of them put in the car, and you see the police officer kicking him. They accuse him of jaywalking on a rural road. I mean, one of these kids is 13 years old that doesn't have sidewalks. Hannibal Johnson, have they been suspended? Have they been fired? Have they been charged with assault, meaning the police officers? So all I know is that the matter is is under investigation as well it should be on the, on the surface of things based on the facts that we know as you just recited them uh, this is deeply disturbing and and troubling so we need to find the facts and we need to hold people accountable um, as appropriate based on the facts and circumstances that are determined through the investigatory process. Well, Hannibal Johnson, I want to thank you very much for being with us, attorney and author of Black Wall Street, From Riot to Renaissance in Tulsa's historic Greenwood District. Um, final question, 20 seconds. Are people getting reparations for what happened in 1921? Wasn't there a commission set up that said they should? There was a commission that was convened in 1997, issued a final report in February of 2001. It recommended reparations for riot survivors and descendants of uh, riot survivors who could prove loss of property. There was a lawsuit filed in the early 2000s. It was dismissed on the basis of statute of limitations. So cash reparations to individuals have not happened. We are looking at reparations in other forms, including uh, building a substantial history center here in the Greenwood District, a pathway to hope that connects various sites in the Greenwood District, and other initiatives that are more community-based rather than individually focused. Thank you so much, Hannibal Johnson. Uh, we will continue to look at Tulsa on Friday on Democracy Now!, when we'll be joined by the sister, the twin, of a man who was killed by police in 2016. Her great-grandmother survived the Tulsa race massacre. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go to Puerto Rico. Stay with us.